we will now try to make this experiment of a hybrid Q&A session. Um, now somebody helps me how we would start this. Do we already have questions from the chat, from the online chat? Or I would say we could start with some questions from the auditorium here. Any questions here? Then I think we could start. We could start with the with the chat questions. I already see uh, Antonia Kalafat and Dr. Adukumi here, and of course Nina is sitting next to me. Unfortunately, we could not establish a stable line with with Sochi Nakayama to Japan. Okay, but it looks like we have the right people. Um, in the line because we have questions to Antonia Kalafat and also to Sam Adukumi. Um, I was keeping an eye on the chat and the first question to Antonia Kalafat is, um, it is difficult for science to be heard by politics in the US these days, but is there a mechanism to translate the enhanced results into policy advice? Is there a mechanism, sorry, I misread this. Um, is there a mechanism to make yourself heard um, and to translate the results into policy advice? Antonia. Can we, can we, we, we can't hear you, sorry for that. Um, I'm sure it's not your muted microphone. We've figured out how to get the sound as well. Maybe if you keep talking, that's actually a good idea so that we include the audio. <laughs> we keep that f question in mind for a little later. Uh, Antonia, sorry, I will come back to you. Make sure your, your microphone is not muted and then we'll um, we will come back to you and try again. I have a question here to Sam Adukumi. Um, first of all, a compliment, very interesting little presentation. And the question is, do you have a risk assessment framework in order to select priority substances for HBM? Thank you very much for the kind compliment and also the question. Well, um, I think um, we have different levels of knowledge and use of risk assessment or risk analysis in, on our continent. It varies from country to country. I can say that in Ghana here, for pesticides, we have a very rigid um, way of assessing the level, uh, assessing the chemical that we use here or import here. So I can say for PESTA we have other chemicals, we have challenges, but actually we are trying to use certain risk assessment methodologies to uh, more or less um, regulate our chemicals used in the country. So we have, the, we have some laws in place and some methodologies have been developed as well. And we have a number of researchers and um, academia and also institutions which um, really undertake some of these measurements for policy um, use. So I can say to some extent, but I cannot say for sure for all the other countries in Africa. I'm sure some of them are well advanced than even Africa, uh, Ghana, but some are also well, well below or behind us because we don't have the uh, uh, use, uh, the needed analytical instruments for really undertaking some of these measurements. But for some sure, we do some assessments on risk, especially exposure assessments. Yes, thank you. Mm -hmm. Okay, how about the audio? No, we don't even have the video now, but of Antonia Kalafat. So I'll just throw in a question to you guys, if you like. Um, Dr. Ovner Sepai from the UK would like to know, what are your views on the use of economic assessment and impact on GDP? And he says these calculations have uncertainties. May I just hand that over to, to you? 
You know, I think it's 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 a question you should answer because I am, as the chair, should keep a bit back. <laughs> okay, thank you. And as far as I understand, the question is about the role of uh, socio-economic um, considerations, and I think, from our perspective, we really see the need to start uh, the risk and uh, the risk minimization by looking at the harmful properties of substances. Because if we're having persistent chemicals in people, if we're having bioaccumulative toxic chemicals in people, we really have to ensure that the regulatory framework prevents the further production of these chemicals. And if only in very, very rare mm. occasions there is an essential use which is still needed for society, then there may be the possibility to have further continued use over time. Um, but in, in principle, currently, we are still giving too many derogations, too many exemptions for substances of very high concern, and we need to accelerate the identification and also the, the restriction of harmful chemicals. And you see the extrapolated level of concern if you look at the numbers presented by Sochi. Look at these numbers, $350 billion that could be saved due to better regulation, getting rid of critical chemicals. These numbers are in itself almost incredible, but still they are calculated and I think we have to deal with them. So what's your view from the NGO side to these numbers? Well, indeed, I think it's, it's very concerning and um, I, I think it's really, it's, it's a global issue. We're talking about chemicals that are used, produced and um, shipped globally. And uh, for Europe, we do have a, a framework in place, um, but it's not implemented as effectively as it should be. And therefore, we need to use, or we need to be really aware of the, the data that shows we need to do much more. So hopefully, some of these paradigm shifts that are needed yeah. will transpire in the EU chemical strategy, because it's long overdue to better address the mixtures. And here, I think just reducing the combined body burden by reducing exposures in general, I would completely agree with, um, with the proposal following the data from Japan. It's about decreasing the general pollution load, and only then can we make progress. I have a question here by Stefan Böse O'Reilly to Sam Adukumi, and the question goes, how can HBM efforts be increased in Africa? The exposure is for sure higher compared to the EU. Yes, thank you very much. I think, um, as I indicated for my presentation, the Global Monitoring Plan under the Scott Convention implementation has really helped us to know what to expect. And perhaps we need to set up monitoring and um, to see the trend of some of these contaminants in uh, our bodies and even also in the environment. So for us in Ghana, for example, we are constituting a team to identify um, institutions we have been trained through the project that we undertook, and now we have more or less um, a core group that know how to go about some of these things. But this needs to be replicated on the other uh, part of the continent or in Africa. So perhaps some researchers they want to help us set up some monitoring programs and we compare what we do here with other parts of the world, the US, Europe, and other uh, Asia. So yes. We need some critical mass of people in Africa, people with knowledge in human biomonitoring that can really, really do some disclosure work that will enable us and our government to understand the issues at stake and actually I mean, help us do the levels and try to put some measures to build or mitigate some of these measures. So we, are, we welcome any um, partners from anywhere, researchers, academia, who want to help us or to partner with us. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Atukumi. That was again interesting. Um, I, have, I have another follow-up question for Dr. Reinecke on one of her first slides, where she said that um, 
when at the time we measure something in human biomonitoring, it's already too late. I think this is a quick wrap up of the, one of the first slides you showed. In, in which respect do you mean it? Do you think that once we measure a chemical in the body or in water, it's already too late that we should reduce the chemical exposure before it happens? Or in terms of a risk perspective, that we have to evaluate the level of this body burden and can say, yes, is it still acceptable or not? No, it, it's really more um, to pinpoint to the fact that harmful chemicals, because many of these chemicals that have been prioritized are known harmful chemicals with serious and irreversible effects, cancer-causing chemicals, persistent bi biochemistry toxic chemicals, endocrine disruptors, and so on, um, that they should not be found in people. These are industrial chemicals, they have to fulfill a use, but actually, I remember when some of these chemicals were found 20 years ago, it was actually a big surprise because they were simply not made to be dispersed widely in the environment. And this is where also Europe, in principle, has the responsibility on the producer to ensure safe use and not wait until we get a dispersion of the chemicals already to the environment, to its human, and then take a lot of time to try to calculate a risk. But rather, I think it's important to take this back and say we need to prevent the exposures where, for all of these chemicals where we can inspect harmful properties, because by the time we have all the analytical methods available to find them, um, or by the time we know the health impacts, which sometimes can also be two generations later, then we are too late to, for a preventative approach. And actually, the EU regulates based on the precautionary principle. So if there's one finding from the science is to really move these kind of considerations to an earlier stage in the decision making. Yeah, Thank you. We, I would like to um, bring in this question addressed to Dr. Adu Kumi again question is going, can Europe support HBM studies in Africa? Do you see a chance for corporations, Dr. Adukumi? You're most welcome. We have been waiting for it because, um, as I said, we have um, challenges with um, the laboratory and the national capacity to, to do so or on our continent. So I believe that um, some of us are ready to even coordinate. So if um, we, we have such invitations or partnerships, we are ready. And as I said, it will help us maybe build that kind of collaboration and also do some comparative study. Because sincerely speaking, the chemicals that we use in Africa are not produced in Africa. They are from Europe and other development countries. And now people are at the uh, receiving end. Using our application is a challenge. So we are doing our best to train our people how to use the chemicals in a, a safe manner, but that's not enough. But if you know about um, the effects and also studies that will help our people understand that chemicals, if we don't use them well, there's some of the effects that will happen to us. I believe that the data information that we share with our authorities will be very useful. Scientists or researchers are available here. We, our arms are open to welcome such kind of partnership. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Atukumi. Yes, you're right. Uh, certainly, the developing countries are on the receiving end in this line. But uh, as you already pointed, also pointed out, uh, some of the exposures are on the higher side. So we have to do something there. And I think human biomonitoring can help. I have a last question from the Q&A part from uh, Dr. Jos Bessens. It's a question for Ninja Reinecke. And he asks, if HBM should not be used as early warning and many chemicals get to the market before they appear on the radar, e.g. through the risk, uh, risk management options, what can we do at the very basics in our chemicals de dependent economy to prevent substances showing up in HBM? 
I think this is, this is something that, that relates to the question I asked you earlier. Yes. <laughs> Indeed. Um, yeah, I think what is clear that we have or can already look at some experiences from over the last years and that the properties of the harmful chemicals um, can already give an assessment and the likelihood if chemicals will be found later on and how many generations they might stay. So therefore, I think designing and using chemicals that are not as persistent, not as bioaccumulative as toxics, is one answer. This is where the innovation drive has to go. So this is actually a task also for, in particular for the companies to innovate in that direction. And then when we reduce these chemical properties, it will automatically um, be leading to reduced exposures. And the second is in particular making sure that some of these chemicals can be if they are still needed, can be used in technological processes, but not for consumer users. So have a, a clearer precautionary generic risk assessment approach for avoiding consumer users, white dispersive users of chemicals that have harmful properties. Because that's how we get here, got here in the first place, allowing um, very persistent chemicals such as PFAS to be widely used in consumer applications so that it's very difficult to stop this now. Good. I think we managed this hybrid Q&A session somehow. It's difficult, but it works. And I might uh, finish it here and uh, lead over to our next plenary speaker. <laughs>